I'm Pam Grove, owner and broker of Advantage Real Estate. Our goal is to make you feel at home while you're looking for your home. Our team of professional agents are rooted in the community and proud to call Warsaw home. If you're looking for property, we invite you to stop by and see us. Our goal is to make you glad that you did. Good evening, I'm Adam Howe coming to you from the BCE TV studios and welcome to the 2020 Republican primary sheriff's debate. The last time we hosted this debate was in 2016 with a live audience. However, this year due to COVID-19, Sheriff Eric Knox will be in our studio and candidate Glenn Spencer will be carried via Zoom. Now for the rules, each candidate will be allowed a one minute introduction and then two minutes at the conclusion of our debate for closing comments. Each candidate is allowed two minutes to answer each question. At the end of two minutes, I will step in, but giving you a notice at 10 seconds. The other candidate will then be allowed a one minute follow up if wanted before we move to the next question. Are we good with that? Sheriff Knox yes. and Mr. Spencer? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, our first question, we're going to go to Mr. Knox first. Thinking about accomplishments while serving as sheriff, you each have highlighted, which one or two do you believe brought the longest lasting positive effect on the community? Okay, well, thank you. And I appreciate you for having us. And um, I thank all the citizens who's gonna be watching this. Uh, to answer your question, probably uh, the community policing aspect. Uh, community policing is important to the office and to the citizens of the community. It's something that we really didn't have here when I took over. Uh, the deputies are going to the pie auctions and the chili suppers. Of course, back when we had them with the COVID thing, it's been a little thin. Um, but the, the citizens actually know their law enforcement. As sheriff, uh, I am out amongst the public. I go to every event that I can possibly fit into my calendar, which means, of course, sacrifice for my family and my time. Uh, but that's that's the job. That's why I'm here. That's what we do. You know, this job isn't about the sheriff or the individual that sits in that chair. You know, the sheriff is actually about the citizens we serve. So number one to me would be the community uh, policing aspect. Uh, I've got three pages of stuff that we as an office and the community have um, have been able to accomplish in the three and a half years. So uh, it would, it would, a lot of these are important from most of the safety aspects to the neighborhood watches that we started. Uh, it's, it's really hard to single out the, the second best because they're also important. Thank you, Sheriff Knox and candidate Spencer. Uh, my biggest, uh, I guess, contribution would be the re reduction of the crime rate. Uh, everybody wants the crime reduced, and I was able to do that every year as an office, you know, for six and a half years. Uh, that is a priority with me. It always will be. Uh, people don't want their stuff stolen. You know, they work hard for what they've got. They want to keep it. They don't want a stone. They don't want the drugs in the neighborhood. It all comes down to reduction of crime rate. Uh, that way people can live a, a safer uh, existence in the county and, and uh, have a better life. You know, like, I don't want to throw my money out the window by having people steal stuff from here or have the, have the dope on the, on the, on the, uh, on the kids. You know, they're, they're, they're trying to get through school. And the main thing we can do is, is, is reduce the crime rate. Get the get more patrols out there to reduce crime. It's all it's all re, re, returns to your investment in the community. If you invest more time and more manpower in the community, in the community, you'll get more back. And uh, I believe that's my greatest uh, asset that I was able to contribute to the sheriff's department. Sheriff gets in one minute. Yeah. So uh, my opponent was last sheriff in 2001. Uh, that's by my calculation about 19 years ago. A lot has changed in law enforcement. Uh, in the way in the way we do law enforcement and even the population of the county you know the world we live in today is a much different world than you know approximately 20 years ago so it's nice to be able to say that uh, you can reduce crime rate but with the amount of deputies that we have and the in the money that we have uh, for those deputies you know we literally have two two and a half deputies on for 24 hours 365 which puts two in 740 square miles so when you do the community policing and you start the neighborhood watches like I've done when I came in, you know, it's a community effort to thwart this crime, not just the sheriff's office. Thank you, Sheriff Knox. We'll now move to our second question, and this one will be directed towards Mr. Spencer first. Candace Spencer said in an interview earlier this month that, quote, many people feel the sheriff's department has turned its back on them when they need the sheriff's department most. 
First, Mr. Spencer, please explain more specifically what this means, and then Mr. Knox, please respond. Okay. Uh, I've received numerous reports and complaints from people about the sheriff's office taking reports over the phone, and that could be for any, any, any situation, whether it's a burglary, a theft, a uh, mysterious vehicle in the neighborhood. Uh, that is no way to do a proper investigation. When somebody wants a deputy there to report a crime, the deputy needs to show up at the crime scene. You can't do a, a crime scene investigation over the phone. It's just impossible. So what you're saying to the people are, okay, we're going to we'll take this report of the phone. It's fine if you got insurance, but if you don't have insurance, you're not going to get your stuff back. It's just gone. The, the, if you got insurance, they might reimburse you, but that's it. You can't do a proper investigation without doing a proper on-scene investigation. There's no way. And Mr. Knox? Well, I would love to have names and phone numbers so I could talk to these folks because that's not what our policies and procedures um, dictate. The only time we did anything from the phone is when we were half staffed uh, due to folks leaving for more pay and better benefits. Um, and we did take some over the phone, but those were unsolvable crimes. For instance, uh, a crushed mailbox with no video or no license plate laying there or um, uh, stolen license plates, you know, low end calls, any felony calls, you know, my staff responds to do a proper investigation. Uh, they're well trained, they're well equipped. And uh, to my knowledge, I don't know of any of that that's going on. And if I do, then there would certainly be some uh, repercussions for those staff members. And any response to that, Mr. Spencer? Okay, well, he just admitted that they did reports with the phone and then he denied, denies it. So, which is it? I mean, I've received many complaints about this, many complaints. And it's just not proper. So either he is or he isn't. But he says right there, he said he did. Well, they do. And then he says he doesn't. So which is it? And Sheriff Knox, you have one minute. Well, to be clear, when you have half of your people, you cannot respond to the low end calls that are unsolvable. We respond to all felonies during that time. And yes, we did not respond to a couple of mailboxes that were crushed or license plates stolen because they're simply not solvable. And we had to save those staff for the felony calls and for the, the calls that are uh, life-threatening. You just, if you have half your staff, you just simply cannot respond to those calls. Uh, but as far, as far as burglaries and things that need uh, a follow-up or an investigation, we went to all of those. All right, thank you, Sheriff Knox. Sheriff Knox, our next question will start with you. State legislation obviously affects local law enforcement. How do you characterize the direction of state laws insofar as the positive or negative impact on a sheriff's ability to serve the community? Well, state law is everything. And that's that's a, one of those areas where the public can help out. Uh, when, and I'll, one, in, one in particular is our, our animal laws, uh, animal neglect and animal abuse. That's all we have besides animal trespass, which is made for uh, the large animals, farm animals. Um, if we don't have the ability to police uh, because of state statute, that's our biggest issue. I I've spent a lot of my time explaining to the citizens why we can't help them just because the state law is in the way. Um, so that's one of those areas where the public can talk to their state representatives and talk to the people that represent us in the Capitol building, as well as myself. That's one thing I didn't realize how much we had to do as sheriffs is actually go to the Capitol building and visit with the lawmakers and debate the lawmakers and uh, testify in front of the councils, you know, to try to uh, create better laws, you know, for our citizens. So, you know, the, the sheriff and, the, and law enforcement have to follow the state laws where the bad guys don't. So it becomes very challenging. And Mr. Spencer, your comments? Well, I'm an animal lover myself in the the animal neglect issues is huge. It's huge nationwide. I agree with, with Eric right there on that. Uh, the, uh, we need, we're not enforcing a lot of the laws that we have on the books, but there are some laws that we need to introduce, like the animal neglect, make it more severe. Uh, these animals, you know, it's, it's no fault of their own. They're just getting abused right and left, and, and there's not a whole lot to stand behind it to enforce that. And Mr. Knox, one minute. No, I have to, I have to agree with Glenn on that. Um, we need better animal laws. We need we need several laws uh, that I can think of off the top of my head. We need those worked on. And the only way that's going to happen is by the citizens talking to their legislators and uh, getting those changes made because there's power in numbers. The more citizens call in, the more citizens talk to their state reps, the more we can get these laws changed. Thank you. And Mr. Spencer, we'll go to you for question number four. 
Recently, the Coalition for Fair Policing, comprised of several like-minded groups, wants changes to disciplinary policies and procedures for vehicle stops that include requiring consent before conducting searches. What are your thoughts? I'm um, against that completely. Uh, if somebody's stopped and it's in incident to arrest, uh, the vehicle should be searched. Uh, as far as within the uh, confines of the vehicle, with anything within reach of the, of the person in the vehicle should not require a search warrant. I think the, the laws that are in force right now are, are, are adequate. I don't believe that needs to be changed in any way. And you still have somebody in a vehicle that could have a weapon within reach. And that's my main concern is, is uh, the weapons and the and dr drugs within reach of the, of the driver or occupants of the vehicle. Thank you, Sheriff Knox. Well, you know, we still have consent searches. The, the search and seizure laws have changed drastically. You know, even since I've been in office, 2017 was a huge change on a lot of laws. Uh, they, they literally change every year. And each year we see law enforcement have less ability, less and less to actually do policing. Um, you know, in a vehicle where you can see in the vehicle, it's all glass, you know, there's, there's less expected privacy in those vehicles. I believe that if, if a vehicle is on the road and, and they're pulled over, uh, they should have the ability to consent to a search. And uh, as far as um, uh, non-consensual searches, we have canines, you know, we have a canine that is fantastic that we can uh, be able to still search some of those vehicles. Uh, but I'm not for any stricter laws on law enforcement's ability to uh, get the bad guys out of our, our out of our citizenship. Thank you, Sheriff Knox. Um, Mr. Spencer, any additional comments in those regards? Uh, no. If not, we'll move on to question number five then, and we'll lead with Sheriff Knox. Sheriff Knox, routine paperwork and administrative duties take precious time away from more active law enforcement. But we also realize they're important to the public and for state and national reporting purposes. What are the most efficient means to accomplish these duties? Well, to be honest with you, there's really no efficient means because the paperwork is so extensive these days. You can, you can expect about a four hour report on a DWI. And when you only have two staff on the road, for 740 square miles and almost a thousand miles of roadway if you have one deputy sheriff off the road that leaves one for that huge amount of space and, and road work um, there's just no way around it and each year uh, they just keep piling more and more uh, reporting on law enforcement uh, if anything uh, other than the the reports you know i'd like to see less paperwork but we're never going to see that um, they're talking about more stringent uh, paperwork for racial profiling, uh, which is we have to, every time we do a traffic stop, we have to state who it was, where they're from, race, sex. I mean, you know, it's about five minutes worth of paperwork just for one traffic stop, just for one form. And that doesn't have anything to do with the traffic ticket or a report that may come from that. So unfortunately, uh, with the small staff that the county has due to tax base issues, um, I would say more than half of our time is spent in the office doing paperwork. That's why you see the cars outside the office. Thank you, Sheriff Knox. Mr. Spencer. I think autom automation is the key here. Uh, when I was sheriff, I was able to bring in the computer system that the current sheriff's office even uses now for their reports and their evidence. Uh, they use the same same software company I brought in 20 years ago. So it's time to update it, uh, get uh, the deputies' time more efficient on what they're doing, and a lot of that is just technology. And Sheriff Knox. Uh, yeah, Glenn's right. Update is the key. Uh, the system that, that he apparently brought in, which is called ITI, uh, they update annually with the, the newest and latest of their version of ITI. And it's, it's simply, I believe our reports are 12 pages long for information that has to go in without the, without the supplemental, uh, which is as long as you want to make it. Uh, as far as updates, you know, they, they update themselves. Um, it's just the amount of paperwork that's required nowadays to put a, a case through court is just exponential since Mr. Spencer uh, was the sheriff. A lot of changes. All right. Thank you. Mr. Spencer, we're going to go to you for our next question. Local businesses catering to tourists say there have been more out-of-towners since the COVID-19 shutdowns. Among them, people who have moved or plan to even move here. How does this impact the county's crime rate and law enforcement in general? Well, you have more people, you're going to have more crime. Uh, you can't really choose and select who enters the county. And, you know, we don't have a welcome committee for them. And they don't have a, have a background check or anything like that. So we'll just have to do the best we can with what we got uh, and who comes in here and, and just let them know, you know, just like we had the meth labs years ago. Let them know they're not going to come down here and cook the meth or do the drugs or do any of that stuff like they did in the city. And Sheriff Knox? Well, we love our, our weekend folks and our part-time people. Um, 
but they when they come down, we have a population of about 19,000. And when our visitors come in and our homeowners, the Walmart thinks that we're up around 60,000 people during the summertime and holidays are even worse. So when you have a staff uh, of 13 road deputies that can just barely take care of, if not even quite take care of the population that we have, when we have 60,000 people that come down to, as they tell me, let their hair down and, and relax and have a good time, uh, they bring the alcohol, they bring the drugs, they bring the crime and the, and the domestic violence, and, and they bring that all to our, our small county. Uh, so it does get to be tough um, to be able to handle those calls. I've got some numbers here. Uh, last year, we had 19,303 calls to service, and that includes everything from a phone call uh, to homicide. And you, you run that you know, per deputy on the road, and you'll see the amount of, of calls that these guys take. We, we need more help. And Mr. Spencer, additional comments? Well, the, the, uh, the population hasn't really grown that tremendous in Benton County because we don't have, uh, there's not that big expans expansion. We don't, have, we don't have the condos. We don't have the, the big lake homes, you know, the multifamily dwellings, multifamily buildings. But the, I had the same amount of deputies 20 years ago. I had the same amount of crime, and we were able to reduce the crime rate. So that's all I got to say to that. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Sheriff Docks, public safety and officer safety in mind with respect to uprisings in major cities with violence against citizens and police. How has public sentiment been affected within Benton County and even surrounding counties that you have worked with regularly? You know, I've said over and over, I'm all over this county, uh, sometimes at night, to uh, day, and I meet a lot of people, and all I can say is we are blessed to live where we live. You know, the people are fantastic. They love their law enforcement, and uh, we don't have those issues here just because of the mindset of the people. Uh, we're predominantly a rural, they consider a rural county. Uh, our folks here are farmers and ranchers and just good people. They don't have the same belief system as some of our, our neighbors do on the east and west coast. So it's a, it's a great place to live and work. And and uh, I am very humbled by their support in law enforcement. And Mr. Spencer. You'll always find more support for law enforcement in rural areas. Uh, that's why I live here. Me and my wife live here. You know, I raise my daughters here. Uh, I don't care for the city and the city crimes. It's just, they can keep that stuff up there. We're content down here with the way we are, with our values and our uh, respect for law enforcement. And uh, I respect everyone in, in blue, expect everyone that's in EMS and everyone that's on the fire service. Thank you. And Sheriff Knox, any additional comment? Sounds good to me. All right, moving right along, Mr. Spencer, with respect to jails in general, are they primarily punitive or rehabilitative? And what would be your jail management style? Well, the, the, the county jails are, are not, uh, they're not really, uh, they're more for housing to see what the prisoner is going to do if they're going to go on to stay prisoner, if they're going to be released. Uh, with the recent changes, it seems like releasing everybody and anybody. So as far as uh, some type of rehabilitation, it's not going to happen within the county jails. There's just not enough manpower, enough money. Uh, You'll be wasting time and effort to try to, to change the recidivism uh, due to the amount of people that come through the jail. And they're not going to be there that long enough to make any progress. All right, Sheriff Knox. Unfortunately, I have to agree with my opponent. Um, a county jail is a holding facility, and 99.8% of the people in a county jail, uh, especially in our county jail, uh, are innocent until proven guilty. So they're there, they're waiting for their day in court. Uh, sometimes those guys can be there um, fairly lengthy, but that depends on the, the legal maneuverings of that particular person and their attorney. Uh, the average stay in our county jail is somewhere around seven to 10 days, uh, but we've had people in there for six, eight months uh, due to the legal maneuverings through their attorneys. So what I've, I've been trying to explain to people ever since I've been in office is just because they're incarcerated inside the county facility doesn't make them uh, bad people. Good people do bad things. You know, DWI, for instance, weekend in jail, that doesn't make them a terrible person. Um, so like, like Glenn said, rehabilitation within the county facility would be nearly impossible just because of the turnover. Uh, that's something they should do in the Department of Corrections where they actually carry out their sentence. And Mr. Spencer, any additional comments in regards to that question? We, we pretty much covered it. All right, moving right along then. Um, Sheriff Knox, what more or different does the Sheriff's Office need that it does not have now? Well, I've pretty much covered all the safety equipment, vests, tasers, spike strips, you know, they're, they're geared up, you know, pretty well. Um, what we need more than anything is help. 
Uh, I would argue with Glenn, but he doesn't have any statistical data like I do. Uh, the difference 20 years ago between now and the call volume, I assure you, is not even close to the same. You know, with the, the day and time of age and where we're at as a nation, uh, I can assure you that the call volume now is probably double from when it was when he was sheriff, but I can't prove that because I don't have the statistics. Um, so what I'm going to say is being able to pay our staff more so we can uh, solicit uh, help from other areas. I mean, don't get me wrong. I've got a fantastic, amazing group of deputies, you know, men and women both working for us now, but we don't retain those folks because we can't pay them what they're worth. So they, they get trained up here. We're always going to be a training facility. And then they move on to bigger agencies for anywhere from five to 10,000. I've even had deputies leave and double their income uh, with the training experience that they, they earn here at, at the Benton County Sheriff's Office. So the one thing I would do if, if it was within my power and it's not, is to be able to offer a better benefit package and a better pay for our employees that are so deserving. And uh, the commissioners, uh, the commissioners aren't real fond of me because I do uh, uh, talk to them quite often on ways to implement. Um, we've also formed a, a nonprofit organization that does nothing but write grants. That's all they do is write grants and uh, help the sheriff's office with funding issues. The, the grants just aren't out there anymore for law enforcement like they used to be. Uh, we apply for federal grants and we get those every year, which helps augment the, the, the equipment that we have. Um, but it's, it's tough trying to get that money to, to retain our, our good employees. Thank you, Sheriff Knox. And Mr. Spencer, uh, your opportunity, does, what does the Sheriff's Office need that it does not have now? I'm not familiar with their, with their current issued equipment, so I really can't comment on what they, what they have and what they, what they need. And as far as the losing deputies to other counties, uh, I didn't have that problem when I was in office. I treated my people right and I treat them fair. When people move to another jurisdiction, yes, they may make, they might make a higher salary, but the cost of living is going to be higher. And you're going to see probably a, a reversal in that with the uh, with the situations going on in the cities. These experienced, trained, highly trained officers are going to be leaving these bigger departments to go to a more rural department. Where there's where there's they, where they don't have the uh, the Antifa in in then those groups the, the the groups that that are causing all the problems and you know these guys are facing criminal charges for doing their job in in the big city so you're going to see a reversal of that and we're going to get more officers in the rural area that are experienced and highly trained all right thank you Mr. Spencer and Mr. That's, Knox that's a that's a nice statement but unfortunately it's it's unfounded. Um, you know, I talk to people that are looking to come to a smaller, uh, smaller organization to get away from the big city crime and, and the stress of, of where they're at. And by the time I get done explaining to them what the, uh, the retirement looks like, because we do not have the, the loggers retirement system like most agencies have, uh, they won't come down. Some of these folks are making, you know, anywhere from 42 uh, to 54. Uh, one guy that we lost, uh, one of my best guys we've ever had through the sheriff's office, he went from... 24 six, which is what the county pays, and it's augmented up to 30,000 with the supplemental fund. He went to $68,000 up by St. Louis. And he, you know, these guys don't want to leave. Uh, I assure you, uh, it is it is money and um, the benefit package that folks move on to because they just can't afford to live down here on that. Every, every deputy I have that I'm aware of has two jobs to work here. All right. Thank you, Sheriff Knox. Gentlemen, that uh, that wraps up our, our formative questions here. We're, we're going to do here. Pardon me? Can I rebut that last one? Um, we'll give you one minute. Uh, you can't take a sample of two people or two officers and make that the norm. Uh, I've talked to numerous officers in cities, and they're wanting to come down here. They want to fish, they want to hunt, and they don't want the BS from the cities. Okay, thank you. The, the difference between the, the folks coming down is loggers. Uh, they have a retirement system that will not transfer to our county, and they will not come down for that. I've, sp I've spoken again, to many of those. But that's not every case. That's not every case. You can't do a sampling of two or three people for the for the whole number of officers that want to come down here. Well, the gen Glenn, that's just two of the many I've talked to. Anyway, okay. that's why we debate. All right, gentlemen. That, like I said, does conclude our, our formative questions. What we're going to do is move to our closing comments now. And uh, Mr. Spencer, we're going to start with you um, to give you two minutes to wrap up, um, cover any point that uh, you wished that maybe we would have raised and kind of give a uh, vote for me because. 
Mr. Spencer. Okay, well, first off, even though Mr. Knox has been, or Sheriff Knox, you know, he's my sheriff too. You know, I respect the guy. I wish him luck, you know, and I think he does the best job he can do. I still have more experience at being sheriff than he does. Uh, I was able, like I said before, I was able to reduce the crime rate. I brought the DARE program back. I brought uh, over $150,000 over $150, per year in grants. I know he's saying the grants aren't there, but the grants are there. They may not be as many, but you have to still have to apply for them and still have to get them. Um, I increased the rural patrols. I reinstated the neighborhood watch programs. I ran the department efficiently and I uh, will vigorously attack drug and theft problems in Benton County. And one other thing I would like to do is uh, some type of drug rehab program. We have so many different entities in this county that are doing drug treatment and drug abuse programs, and they're not making very much very good progress. We need to combine those programs together with, with the county, with county sheriff's department involvement, and uh, get a decent program that works and that's, that's pretty cost efficient. Uh, like I said, we have so many other entities doing this right now and there's no common, there's no commonality with them. They're all different. So we need to combine those and do our best to make the Benton County drug free. Thank you, Mr. Spencer. Uh, Sheriff Knox. Well, first and foremost, I want to thank the citizens of Benton County for their overwhelming support. You know, without the citizens whom we get our authority from and the support from the community, uh, the sheriff's office is nothing. Uh, we have fantastic staff and the community supports them uh, day in and day out, uh, overwhelming support. Uh, so, you know, I want to thank the community and I look forward to, you know, serving them again for the next four years. All right, gentlemen, uh, on behalf of BCE TV, we want to thank you each for your time and uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, we uh, we appreciate the time that you give and and. Uh, gentlemen, again, we'd like to thank you for joining us today, and we thank our viewers, and uh, we look forward to uh, this election coming up here in August. Oh, no. Are you okay, Mike? Yeah. I had a pretty big fender bender here. Don't worry. State Farm's got you covered. <sighs> That's great to hear. Bobby, what's going on? We're going to get you a tow truck, Mike. Thank you. A little fender bender going on. Fender bender. Fender bender. Fender bender. Fender bender. Everybody remain calm. Go with the one that's here to help life go right. In Warsaw, talk to State Farm agent Susie Broderson today.